Hey everybody, happy Friday. Uh, as usual, it's our live stream, it's our Friday stream. And I've got, uh, I'm Eric. For those that don't know me, for those that are tuning in that are new, I am, we take turns and it's my turn. And I've got my trusty sidekick, you can't see him, but you'll hear him, uh, Donovan. Donovan, can you say yep. hi for us? The ethereal voice. The ethereal voice, yes. The ethereal voice. I'm here to be the voice of the people. Welcome everybody. Um, on whatever platform that you're joining us on i'll be uh, i'll be checking out the comment section so anytime during this process if you have a comment or a question for eric uh just throw it up on there and i will uh, i'll get it over to him yeah so we're just gonna get we're just gonna get into things I, we kind of teased out what we're doing i'm gonna spend uh i'm not gonna spend a ton of time kind of setting up what we're doing today because i'm just gonna do it you know instead of it's like kind of good filmmaking which is show don't tell but I will say that we're going to do a little bit of a departure, and in a good way. Um, I want to spend some time in mapping and analysis, and that's because uh, any project you do is going to need, or hopefully have, some um, thought behind before you get into the modeling part. We always dive right into just live modeling, but I love you know when we kind of take a step back and kind of think about the you know the larger world or the larger context in which we live and work within, in which we're modeling in, we're designing for, if you're architecture, urban design, um, maybe a little bit less interiors because you're often inside, but landscape, urban design, architecture, definitely, definitely context is important. So let me shrink myself down here and we'll get into it. And I'll say, uh, we'll say hi from uh, the chat and we'll see who's, who's tuning in with us today. Yeah, any shout outs? Um, I've got the chat overlay over here on this side, so, um, Feel free to make your comments. Your comments will be shown everyone from LinkedIn to X to Facebook. Are we streaming X or not? I can't remember, but definitely. we are. We are. Okay, good. So I know that uh, we always say this, but if you have any challenges with the stream, head over to our YouTube channel, uh, SketchUp's YouTube channel, find us under the live section, and then that way you can participate with us there as well, um, or you know whichever platform works for you. So any housekeeping items, um, Donovan, before I just... Because once I get going, you guys know me. You yep. know, I I don't leave. I don't pause. We got uh, we got our, some of our regulars uh, joining us today. We got some people from uh, Hungary because we do always have an international audience. From I am going to say this wrong. Skinect oh Skinect Skinectedy yeah Sk New York yeah. Uh, Chile Vancouver Canada where it's uh, three degrees Celsius thirty seven degrees Fahrenheit. It's reasonable for a December day. That seems very not chilly enough for Vancouver, Canada, but I, I guess it could be wrong. Uh, Sudan, um, all over Mexico, United States. We've got like, like every time we've got an international reach here and it's amazing to see all the people that are, uh, that are joining us to come hang out and, uh, watch Eric do his thing. Yeah, speaking of my thing, um, what 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 am I doing here? I'm going to ask myself that question quite a bit because I haven't done this in a while, but it's something I used to do a lot in urban design um, is is mapping. Um, I love I actually love to I love being in cities, but I also love um, I love I don't know I just love the way they look actually. So so where are we in the world? Why am I doing this? Uh, when we talk about site analysis, I'm going to just I had to kind of pick something because otherwise, what site are we analyzing? And I reminded me of this uh, a project I sort of worked on a long time ago. It was for a proposal for this park in downtown LA. So if anyone knows familiar with LA, there's sprawling LA, right? It's gigantic and massive. And if you just kind of zoom in almost to the dead center of downtown, you get this really interesting park called Angels Knoll. And if any of you, fun fact, have seen the movie 500 Days of Summer, there is the um, that bench that they sit on. That's that's this park. That's this parcel. And it's really, really unique because it's, it's very rare that you get up high and you have open space in downtown LA. There's a little bit of topography, but mostly it's flat and it's mostly it's tall buildings. So, so I picked that just kind of at random because I needed, I wanted something with topography. I wanted something that was kind of a landmark and I wanted something with some really nice intense built form around it. So that's kind of where we are. So um, Donovan, you said you've seen 500 Days of Summer. That's one of my- I did, it is- uh, not my favorite, but I love it. Love that movie. Great movie. It's always fun going back and watching it because the first time I watched it, it I had a very different experience. Um, I follow uh, Hit Record Joe. I don't know if you if you follow him at all, but Joseph Gordon Levitt has a company called Hit Record Joe. 
uh, and he puts out a lot of very creative, um, very creative art uh, on the internet. A lot of he, he's a very creative person, and so I like following him to be inspired by all the stuff that he does. And I remember watching an interview with him, and he's like, uh, "My character in Five Hundred Days of Summer is not the good guy; he's the bad guy in that yeah, story." That's what? Funny. So I went back and watched it. I'm like, "Oh, this is a totally different movie now." <laughs> I'll have to, oh. I'll have to watch it and thinking about that. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I'm, not to cut you off. We did have a, a comment coming in from Facebook saying, Hey, I'm new to SketchUp. I bought SketchUp Pro during the Cyber Monday sale. Uh, thank you to everybody that uh, took advantage of our Cyber Monday sale. If you are like Andrew over on Facebook and you are brand new to SketchUp, one thing that I really want to recommend and give a shout out now is we have something called SketchUp Campus. It's learn.sketchup.com that if you are new to scam, uh, to SketchUp, it is the best way, hands down, to learn SketchUp. And Eric being learn. one of the instructors Sketchup. on SketchUp Campus. Yep. Com. Yeah, I kind of plug it a lot. I don't know. I'm kind of partial to the instructors. So um, <laughs> if you... As you should be. If you take a course, and again, if you... Every time we're putting out new courses um, a few times a year, there are a lot of work. There's a lot of information in them. We go into a lot of detail and we go step by step. So you get the resource files from the beginning, you get the midpoints, you get the end, you get the links to anything that we can't give you, provide you get the link to where to find it. So we really um, hold your hand and that's the intent of campus. It's different than these, than our live streams that we're doing now. So, so um, I'm not starting in SketchUp. I'm breaking the rules today. And that's because um, I wanna kind of point out the fact that when we talk about data, Maybe I will start in SketchUp, but I'm going to spend, but only for a minute, um, because what we need to do is geolocate our site. But when we talk about data, data, only so much data can come from SketchUp itself. It comes from elsewhere. And so what I want to do is kind of point out some of the challenges to finding good data and then getting it into a format that SketchUp likes and then getting it cleaned up to a point where I can then um, do something really beautiful or really pretty with it. And I'm going to try to do this in layout. In my past, I would do it in Illustrator, but I, I, I've been, the more I use layout, the more I love, you know, what it can do. So I'm going to kind of try, I've been slowly sort of moving my workflow in towards layout. So let's start here with a geolocation ad location. And I don't know why it's not thinking that I'm logged in. I'm pretty sure that I was logged in. Let's do this in, I have a multiple windows. I'm going to, we can transfer files in between the two. So let's try that one more time. Is it going to yell at me this time? No. Okay, cool. So we're going to find Los Angeles. And there is a new version. I'm not going to do that right now, but there's a new labs version of ad location. I'm excited to play with that. I'm not going to do that on this stream, though, because I'll end up just fumbling around. I need to find right here, there's our site, and I don't really need this aerial so much. I may use it, I may not, I'm not quite sure, or I may use the street map. So depending, I think right now I'm not quite sure. I'm just gonna select something. And the reason why is because I just wanna geolocate the site. I just wanna make sure that we have something in here. Um, how's my tiled boundaries? Okay, good. So the geolocation is important because it's not just bringing in the aerial image to my starting file, but it's also bringing in the latitude and longitude. So it actually knows where I am. So if I have a tall building and I wanna do a shadow study, that latitude and longitude is gonna be really important. So even if I don't know what I'm doing with this yet exactly, and I don't know if I'm gonna need it, I am going to start just as best practices, start by doing that. And I can double check to see what my terrain looks like as well. If we're gonna do like a little section cut or a little terrain analysis. So you can see that there's that hill, and it, it sort of sits on that slope. So. All right, got it. I'm gonna save that, save. See, I'm already gonna start with saving. Uh, learned, we all, we all should know better by now. Angels, I'm gonna call this angels, if I could type um, null, because that's kind of what it is. It's also called angels landing. Oh, fun fact, that's just the uh, funicular. If anyone's ever been to, on what's called angels flight, that's actually the funicular that takes you up. Uh, it's a historic one that goes up that hill. So if you've ever been to LA, check that out, that's cool. Is it like a, a tram or a... Yeah, funicular is a train that goes up a hill. Huh. So it goes, it's not vertical, you know, it doesn't, so that's an elevator, but it kind of goes up a slope. So oh, so like uh, San Francisco type type stuff. The little trams that go up the up the hills. Viniculars, vernaculars, viniculars. 
we'll come back to that. I want to go. I want to okay. go to QGIS right now. So QGIS is a, a Mac because I ArcGIS is for PC, and I'm on an Apple here, as you can see. So I'm going to start in QGIS, which is a free open source GIS. It's pretty robust, but it's like it's opening Blender for the first time, or it's opening 3D Studio Max. I have no idea what I'm doing. I only know like how to do three things in this, and it's how to get GIS data out of um, uh, into a format that SketchUp likes. So let's do that. I've already spent some time. I'm not going to use your time to do this today, folks, but I am. I do have some some GIS data that you can find online. So a lot of this is free. Some cities will put it behind a, a, a gateway and you need to go contact them, but others put their data out for free. I'm going to grab what's called, let's see, a county boundary. So a county boundary, I like to kind of start with the largest piece of information and then I kind of go into more and then I kind of narrow down to the more site-specific stuff. So in QGIS, one thing I learned is that if you click on a layer, it opens up some layer properties and I can turn the color fill off because I sometimes don't like to see whatever color. For some reason, it comes in with the color fill. So this is the county of LA. This is going to be important because this is going to be how I, um, I want to do a location map that shows where my project is within the county of LA and then within the city, and then I want to show the site. So I always kind of like to start really broad. So if I wanted to do this here, I could, I could do a test and see if this works. Fingers crossed. It's been a long time since I've done this, and sometimes it's particular. Sometimes it's picky. It gets kind of sensitive whether it works or not. I'm going to call this county, and I'm going to make sure that I'm saving it in my project folder. I'm going to call this LA County Boundary. And that's a .dxf. Yeah, if there's any questions um, why I'm doing it, why I did it this way, if there's a better way to do it, obviously bring those questions. I love answering those. Um, so I'm saving that. And then what I want to do is just hit OK and hope that that exports OK. Because then when I pop into my SketchUp, I can come over here and grab what is an LA County. That's a DXF. So a DXF is a CAD file, just like a DWG. It's going to ask me, you know, what, do I want to do anything with it? I'll just leave it as it is. Hope that's okay. Click okay. Fingers crossed. This is where I always hold my breath because I never know. I can do this 100 times and sometimes the information, the CAD information just is not happy. Or it's just really complex. It's like really just way more details, way more information than I actually need. So there it is. Now I'm going to, so it did work. So that was good. I'm going to check the scale on this, though, because it's quite large. I don't know if it's one to one. I don't think it is. I think it exported it at the scale of the map. So for this, I don't really need this to scale because this is more like a location diagram. It's just to kind of say where where we are in the world. You with me, Donovan? I'm just going to check in. <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm with you. Still right. picking up what you're putting down, so we're good. Awesome. Randy says it ex exported it at one to 10,000. <laughs> oh, is that what my scale factor was? Yeah, so if I wanted to make it real world scale, I could then use that scale factor and scale it up or what I could do. In this case, this is just a location. I just wanna kind of have this, whether I wanna, I don't think I need to do anything in 3D with this, but I'm gonna bring it into SketchUp because when I go to layout, then I have all my information in one file. So I don't know why it's taking so long to delete. I'm just trying to delete, that's Catalina Island. Um, Maybe I should have left it, but I guess that's technically part of LA County. That's yeah, funny. and it looks like from the comments, it looks like there's a few people that have never used layout before. So this will be a, a good be learning. Fun. Yeah, we're gonna yeah we're gonna start in we're gonna start a little bit in GIS and I, and we're gonna look at some open data. Let me. That's a great question. What are how are we getting where What is the end goal? We're going to then go into SketchUp. We're gonna do some cleanup. We're gonna do some analysis. We're gonna do some layering. We might change some color styles, and then depending, we might go what we want to do, we could either leave it there or we could take it into layout. We can apply a scale to it. We can apply some text to it. We can apply some additional color fills to it. So like I said, it's, um, like I said, when you're working with CAD files, you never know what you're going to get. It's a bit like Forrest Gump and his box of chocolates. So I don't know why it wasn't happy with trying to delete that Catalina Island. So I'm just going to leave it. Leave it. Sorry, it's not going to impact the model too much, correct? Yeah, I mean the other way to do this. I mean this is a bit, this is a bit 
complicated way to do it to say, do I really need the GIS file for this to get this boundary? I could probably get an EPS or I could probably get something else and go straight into layout. But I want to, so let me, before I go back into SketchUp and try importing that data again, let me just open up a fresh SketchUp and then let me go back and show you sort of, we don't necessarily have to do this, but I just kind of wanted to show you the process and I won't belabor the point. I won't, I won't beat up beat it up but there's all kinds of cool information like if i want to do something like the city boundaries i just grab the city boundaries data drop that in and now i have all the city boundaries so now i know not only where la county is but i know where the cities are so this weird shape if you follow this big one here it looks like a i don't even know what that looks like um a heart or something like that. And it's got this little line that goes down to the port of Los Angeles. That's the city of Los Angeles is this big, massive one. And then it goes in from there. So that's the city of LA. And then I can keep going if I wanted to, I can grab parcels. So building parcels. So if this was important to my analysis to know where my site is, I could um, bring in building parcels. Now I'm gonna look at, uh, in, a, in a minute, I'm gonna look at another way to do this information where I'm not having to download everything from the county um, or everything from the city of LA. Like this is a lot of, it's a lot, I mean, it's a lot of data. That's why we, we do it in GIS and we don't do this all straight in like SketchUp or in CAD because it's a lot of data. So here's LA, uh, here's downtown. You can tell downtown is because downtown turns at like a 45 degree angle. Um, so you can kind of find downtown because it's sort of a tilted grid like this. Yeah. Is that downtown? Is that where I'm supposed to be? If I'm not sure, there's a little trick here. Um, let me get rid of this fill because then I won't have to um, outline, simple outline. Because then I, I, can see, I can see a little bit better where I am. There's a little trick if you're not sure where you are. Like if you're looking at the parcels like I am and I'm just like, wait. Where am I? I'm kind of up oh, there. I am actually. I think I found it. That's downtown. But there's this cool way you can come in and you can always add in um, a map layer underneath it. So if I wanted to bring in an open street maps layer, I could just bring that in and then set that to the background, and then that makes it much easier for me to find my site. I have to find. If you go down here to, sorry for the refreshing. I know that's annoying, but it's so much data. It has to. It literally reloads from memory each time. So there's my site now. There's my open street maps. I can turn that off. Lastly, I'm going to pull in, and I'm probably not going to export all of these right now because um, it might take too long. But lastly, I want to grab is my building footprints. So you can find, we can find roads, we can find parcels, anything you basically, the data, if it's available, you can find it. So there's my building footprints. So I'll go through that same process, like if, if maybe I'm not going to do this for all of LA County, but I'm going to try this again for just, let's try this again for just um, the parcels and the building footprints. Let's turn this simple fill off really quick, just so that I can see. Uh, now, is there a reason why you would need like literally all of the data for all of the buildings in that area rather than just like a square block? Um, it just depends on how far you want to do the analysis. Like um, if we're talking about things like transit stations, like if I wanted to figure out how, how which transit stations are nearby, I would probably want to pull out at least two or three blocks because chances are there's, I mean, there actually is one right next to the site, but I might want to find where the different lines connect or cross. So there's a reason why you want to kind of give yourself more information than you need. Typically, you want to kind of look about what's called a half mile to a mile out because that's sort of what would be like the district boundary. So in this case, here's my site right here in the middle. And I want to kind of give myself what looks like maybe a half mile. And I'm just guessing at this point. So now I'm going to go one more time. Let's just try this and see if this works. And then I'll give up on the GIS now that I've kind of explained the process of where we get the data, which is we're going to call this the site blocks. We'll just call that blocks. It's parcels and building footprints. And we'll click save. Um, oh, dot DXF, and then we'll click OK. We did have a question coming in from uh, Mark on LinkedIn. He's asked if this presentation is archived for future reference. Uh, yes, uh, after every live, uh, these videos are uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you miss parts of this live or any other live that we do here, uh, here at SketchUp, you can always go check out the archives on our SketchUp channel. Yeah, I mean, 
That's a great question. Thank you for that. I mean, I go by, I go pretty quick because we only have two hours and we're going to try and, um, and it's a lot to, to try and cover a whole process in two hours, believe it or not, is, um, is pretty difficult. So, so yes, you may want to, we go fast for a reason. Go back and watch it anytime you want. Pause it. So in this case, this is great. One thing that's kind of nice is it preserved the, it preserved the, um, when I exported to DXF from QGIS, it preserved the building footprint, sorry, the layers, uh, which is, it's called layers, but obviously as you, when you're in SketchUp, it's tags. So the tags are there. So the building footprints and then also um, the parcel lines. So the building footprints came in as just outlines, but now when I now I might want to come into something like NROTH extensions, NROTH face creator, and if if I'm lucky, if these building footprints are are solid and they're um, they're closed boundaries, I should be able to fill uh, the inside of those. So while that's and if and I can't tell if that went if that worked, but I can just pop a piece of I can pop some color on it. And you can see that it wasn't perfect. These aren't perfect boundaries, but it gets you somewhere. It gets you to a starting point um, where you can begin to layer the information that you want. I'm gonna save this now because this is my CAD file. Uh, and then I have my geolocation map as a different file. So I wanna actually take a second to bring those together. So if there's any other comments, now's a good time because I'm gonna pause for just a second to save this. Uh, Brad is saying that my uh, my voice is much louder than yours, so I may may have to talk a little bit quieter. I can bring my microphone a little closer to my face, but if I do that, and then you'll hear me like breathing, and oh, so that's probably where I like to keep it. About that. I I scooted the uh, I scooted my mic a little bit further away from me, so I'll uh, I'll keep it down a little bit. Okay. Ah, oh, you sound okay to me, but I'm actually maybe turned I turned my volume down a little bit, so maybe that's why you sound why you sound good, Donovan, to me. Yeah, thanks for letting us know, everyone. Um, okay, so where are we at? We are now, I've got two th different files now, one with a geolocation and one with some parcel information. So what I wanna do is kind of merge those. So I'm gonna grab what I'm, I'm gonna grab um, that CAD file with just the parcels. And again, this is just, um, this is just the beginning stages of this. So this isn't necessarily, you know, the. I would probably get more layers and I would probably, if I was doing this, you know, really properly, I would probably spend some more time. So one thing that came in is when I, I it did come in, I did export it, didn't come in one-to-one. -one. It came in scaled because it was, um, so that's maybe that was something I did wrong. But what I could do pretty quickly is just kind of get a sense of, um, let's see here, what is my what is my parcel? It would be inside of back of curb to back of curb. So for that, I'm gonna go with 311 feet. And then you go into this group so we don't accidentally, let's go something like that, 311 feet. I don't want to actually grab the geometry. I want to kind of, because then it'll do a guideline. So I'm trying to do it off to the side. It doesn't look right, does it? It looks small. Looks like it didn't get it. It's looking pretty, pretty close. Uh, I think it's, hang on, I'm putting my x-ray mode on here. So that way I can see my transparency a little bit better. So where was my site? Right here? Yeah, I didn't, it didn't pick that up. So this one should have been from here to there. That was, that block was about 300 feet. So let me try that again. I don't know why that didn't scale. If I want to kind of grab that block at 300 feet, it should say, do you want to scale? I say yes. And it doesn't do it. I don't know. Folks, live streams. I always blame like our streaming equipment because who knows what it's doing in the background. It like takes over the operating system and it's like a ghost in the machine. All right, so I'm gonna pause there because you know what? You might say, okay, Eric, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool that you showed us that we can get open data from county websites or city websites we can use a free program like QGIS, or if you have a license for ArcGIS, that's great. It's just literally just popping the shape file in and then exporting to D DXF or DWG. That's that's all I did um, other than take that fill out. So that's, that's all I'm, because um, what I want to do is, and then you can decide how much information you want. What I love about this is that you can decide how much um, is, if I want to go this far, I can do that. If I want to turn the, uh, the if I want to put the, let's see here, those are the buildings. Yeah. 
Yeah, like it gives you a really nice figure ground. And there we it's go. amazing. I'm looking at this and like how, you know, our computers are pretty advanced compared to what they used to be. And you're like, there are times when your computer still has to think. And I can only imagine what this type of work must have been like five, 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I mean, it, yeah, it's probably pretty similar. I don't know how much advances they've had, to be honest with you, in, in, in open data stuff. But, um, but it gives you, I mean, like even just like this, even if I just brought this in and then and then put this in or brought this exported and went straight to layout, it's kind of cool because graphically it gives me a nice figure ground. I can just see without even having the freeway lines where the major freeways are and the fact that, you know, the grid, you know, sort of tilts and shifts and stuff like that. So really just kind of some, it's really just about what information do I want to glean from it. So let's pause there because there's two other places that I want to grab some information from. I want to look at a different way to do that because um, that's just if I want, like, I want to grab all the stuff in the city and I know that geolocation, you know, is only going to give me, I mean, it's only going to give me the aerial and it's only going to give me so much. So, so let's look at another way, another way to do this. And I've, I've been, you've seen some of my probably shorter videos, but there's a great, let's see here. There's a great website that's called CAD Mapper. And so this is also open data. So if you wanted to, it's open, it pulls from publicly available data, which is why you can do it for free. And then if you have lots, if you want lots of data, then you can purchase it. But for example, I wanna do a little site analysis. I wanna do a little map study of just my site here in downtown LA. So I just kind of zoom all the way in till I hit a kilometer. So once I'm at, if I'm under one kilometer, I can get that for free and then anything above that you just pay and sometimes it's worth it uh, pay five bucks or whatever and get a nice big site so this is going to give me the all that sort of similar information anything that's open data is part uh, it's going to give me the it's going to give me streets it's going to give me parks it's going to give me buildings so i'm going to go ahead and try that i'm going to see what would happen if we just paused on the 2d step for right now and just said let's let's come back to that but let's we'll use that for our location map but let's go ahead and um see what we can get from a data perspective in 3D. It looks pretty cool. So I'm Randy in the comments says, 10 years ago, this would have been done on a remote server, much the same way we still send stuff up to the cloud to get processed today. today. Yeah. Interesting. I love that we have a wealth of knowledge in this chat when it comes to, we've got all ages and stuff, so different ages, different backgrounds. So this is this is kind of cool. You can see now I've got my site in 3D, but it's a little bit, it comes in with no color. So it's a little bit maybe difficult to see what's going on. I wanna do a couple things. This first thing I wanna do is just kind of line it up. So I'm gonna grab a, a point where I think some sort of building, like this building's got this really interesting sharp, I don't know what you call this trapezoid. My maths, my geometry skills, and then bring this in. Turn my X-ray mode on. This is two hours of just me thinking out loud. So for anyone you know who's, so I really appreciate you know the people who have tuned in today, because yep. because it's like I have to ask myself questions like, wait, how how do I do this again? Why why would I, why would I do it this way? All part of the process, it's part, right? It's, you're right. All part of the process. Yeah, it's process illumination. I think that's a fancy term for it. So one thing I wanted to do from a site analysis, if I'm going to diagram it, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to bring in the terrain or not. In this case, um, you can choose in CAD Mapper whether you want the terrain to be in there or not, because there's a reason for that, is that sometimes it's easier to do stuff when it's flat. But if I want to cut a section through this, for example, just to check this and see what this looks like really quickly, I'm just going to cut a section and I'm going to kind of align it to my grid. And I can kind of get a really quick sense of, of my part of my site. And toggle that off, turn my axes off. And there it is. You can see it's this little 
park but you know sits on that slope where you get that really amazing view to that sort of block that sort of in this in this area that's we were sitting right here when we looked at that park bench image so that's kind of cool because this is really important the topography is really important to this part of the site so if i wanted to cut a section or something like that i thought you know it's probably a good idea to preserve that but let's Peggy go. chimed in and said, I think many of us would be happy to spend a few hours listening to how Eric thinks through processes. I never but that's I why never we're here now. <laughs> I never want to assume. So thanks for that feedback, Keggy, because um I see I'm stuck I'm stuck with myself. So I you know this is normal for me. Um not that's not a crazy sound. That's just that's <laughs> those are the gears that are, you know, the gears are just kind of going and going. Um I'm going to soften the coplanar on that because some of those curved faces came in faceted. So I want to basically show those nice and smooth. Now, one little trick here, you may have seen this in a skill builder, is that instead of going in and painting these, if I want to differentiate these, sometimes what I'll do is come over to color by tag. And right now, by default, they all came in the same color. They came in from CAD Mapper as the same color because what did, they don't know. So buildings, I have to make a decision. And I might say, for right now, let's just make those light gray. So all of a sudden now I'm getting some differentiation. The topography, I'm going to make that, that's the ground mesh, make that white so that it blends in with my background, or I may wanna just turn that off completely so that it doesn't interact with my roads. My roads, I will make kind of a medium gray just so that they're not super. So you can start to see the diagram almost build itself here by just using color, um, just by using my color by tag. And railways I can ignore because those are just lines. They're they're just literally lines. And then um, I do want to make sure that parks parks are green. That makes sense, right? Make a park green. So there's a park. Yep. It's funny that it doesn't make it doesn't think that Angel's Knoll is a park. So if for some reason I wanted to show that as a park, I would I would color that myself, I guess, because CAD, CAD Mapper didn't pick that up. The other thing is, is you look at all these edges and stuff, um, pathways, darken those up a little bit. See all these edges and things? Um, there's a great extension, but before I use that, CAD Mapper, they bring these in as segments because what it is, it's actually a polyline. And GIS data and open data is actually a single line. It's a center line. So that when you export it, it applies the line thickness based on the type of road that it is. So that's that's why you're getting these radius on the edges of your lines, and that's why you're seeing those as segments that overlap. So I'm going to spend just a minute to select all of the information on the same tag. So all everything that's a path, I'm going to group it. Everything that's a, a major road, I'm going to group it. Anything that's a minor road or a secondary road, group it. And then I'm going to group secondary roads, major roads, or primary roads and paths all together. And that's kind of cool because then what I could do if I really wanted to get rid of these tags, I could just get rid of those, assign them to untagged, assign paths to untagged, and then create a new tag and call that paths or call that circ, circ for circulation. So I'm going to, I'm going to assign that to a new nice clean tag, which is going to be circ. Another reason to do that is because what it does is the geometry comes in, the raw geometry comes in tagged and by getting rid of deleting the original tags, it puts raw geometry untagged, which is the way it should be. Raw geometry should be untagged, group should be tagged. So, so that's kind of why I, I group everything together, assign a new clean tag, and then delete the original ones. That's the fastest way to get rid of um, that tagged that tagged geometry is to, is to delete the tag and then assign it to untagged. Okay. That is something I need to take more advantage of when I'm modeling SketchUp because that's convenient. There's a great extension by Fredo called um, Hide Edges. It's a free one. It's it hides and unhides edges. So there's a there is a way to do that with native tools by going into monochrome mode. You go to monochrome, uh, or sorry, you go to wireframe, and then you can select only edges. But in this case, what I'm going to do is use um, Fredo's extension. And this is it's churning, but that's because it's a complex. I'm trying to hide a lot of just the edges right now. So I'm seeing the paths because 
because of the way that those center lines created this, these um, road segments in pieces. If you hide the edges, then that gets rid of those, so you don't see those. So while that's going, I'm going to try not to. I'm going to try to be patient and just let it churn and process. Um, so how's it going? Yeah, let's check in with the chat. How's everybody doing today? It's Friday. It's almost yep. the holidays are almost here. It's getting colder, hopefully, uh, or it feels <laughs> winter feels like winter's. You know, how about where you are? donovan uh it is uh mid 70s today so i got guff during our morning meeting for not wearing my traditional holiday sweaters because i have a collection of holiday sweaters that i tend to wear but it was it was just too warm to wear one this morning but i uh i had to put one back on for our big team meeting gotta be festive yeah well I don't have any holiday sweaters, but so I, I admire that you not only have a bunch, but you also, you know, enjoy wearing them. So that's you're inspiring me to get into the holiday spirit. I do. I it's not very often that I get to wear sweaters here in Oklahoma, so it's nice to nice to be able to wear some sometimes. Um. Okay. So so as you can see that worked i was able to get um it took a second and that's why i was trying to be patient but it i was able to um get rid of those edges so you can see what that looks like now if we kind of diagram it like this um we can start playing with styles and if i wanted to for example maybe even play with adding turning my edges white i don't know that's gonna isn't it funny how sketchup kind of tries to be to tries to be super smart it says if you're doing white edges, you shouldn't have a white background. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. It's like SketchUp, stop being, stop trying to be so smart. Let, let me have white edges on white background. Um, Randy just chimed up in the uh, in the comments said I discovered diffusion in SketchUp, which is uh, something that we just released not too recently. Oh, diffusion. We, maybe yeah. we should try it, that if we have time towards the end, just as a fun, you know, if we get done early. Um, yeah, fun little experiment. So the cool thing about this here is that I'm actually using a 3D, um, I'm using a 3D, my 3D information imported from CAD Mapper, or you can do it from OpenStreetMaps, or you can do it from GIS, depending on where you're getting that data from. I showed you a couple different places to do it. You can see that I still have, um, if I turn my, um, if I turn my color by tag, I still have my location terrain here as well. So if I want to go in and reference something that's not showing, like if I need to pinpoint something like, oh, there's a special tree or there's this, you know, kiosk or something that maybe just doesn't show up on that data, um, I can always just go back in and reference my image. I don't need it for right now, but you can see I've got, I've got that in there. Um, yeah, so I'm in plan view. I'm not in plant view. I'm not planting. This is not a landscape project. This is a sort of a contextual analysis project. So we need to think about, first of all, uh, the next thing I want to think about is doing a, uh, what I need to do is I need to show where our site is. That was weird. Okay, I need to show where our site is. So what I there's a few different ways to do this. I mean, I can simply just draw a boundary here and just kind of follow the road edge. But if you have, um, if you know the site is a particular parcel, then of course, like everything, you want to be accurate and you want to go ahead and um, see, so you want to go ahead and don't do what I'm doing, which is just tracing it. But right now from a distance, I just want to be able to show that our site is this, everything that sits sort of within this block here. And then I'm just going to switch to my default view. My default view being um, turning my GIS data off. Okay. Oh, what is that information? That one is. Oh, I see. That's a shadow being cast. Okay. So here's my property line. Now I traced it on a slope. So what, if I wanted to show that property, I may want to take this thing and copy this up and I all, and then come in here and then use NROTH's flattened plane, or I can keep that sloped and use something like, if I used NROTH's flattened plane, I'll show you why. Because NROTH's flattened plane will flatten it. And then if it's flattened, then I can create a boundary 
And then if, if I have a nice solid boundary, then I can offset it and give it and just give it um, a thickness like this, call it um, five feet. And then from there, I can apply a color to it. Let's make that a red color. That's just gonna be kind of my site boundary. Styles, let's update the style. And then let's make this a working scene. So I'm going to go to my scenes and turn off camera location and change this to the name working. There we go. So the reason why is because anytime I'm working, I can just click working if I'm over here in plan view and I'm working over here, I can just go back to working scene and it'll just change that style for me. So it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Problem is, is it didn't remember I need to turn off. I need to turn off parcels. I need to turn off shadows. I need to update that. Yeah. And I also need to turn off my axes. So somehow my style didn't, didn't reflect that. There we go. Yeah, a lot of bouncing around, but that's the way these things work. Um, that's just kind of how it is, is that, you know, when you're, we're just kind of dumping everything in right now and then making sense of it is the hard part. It's like, okay, now I've got a property line. Now I've got my site boundary or my site fill. Now I've got, you know, um, I've got my key pieces of information, parks, roadway, circulation, topography. Um, so if I go into plan view here, you can see that I've kind of given it just a site boundary. Um, that may not be that, you know, you could also just do it as a dashed line, but I kind of gave it as a thick line so I could see it from, from a nice distance. So if you did want to color, if you didn't want to do, if you didn't want to use color by tag, you can just select everything and just make sure that there's no color applied and then you can apply something like this. But I really like working with, I like working in, I like having almost a monochromatic model and then I like having a diagrammatic one. And that's that way I can get kind of the most bang for my buck. So- um, Except for the parks, right? Except for the parks, yes. Yeah. yeah, so when I monochromatic, that's right. You could just turn the parks off if you didn't want the green at all. But if that's part important to the story, it's all about what's important to what we're trying to show. If we're saying, hey, there's no parks here, maybe whatever we develop in this site ought to have some green space because we don't really have a lot. That's not really true though, because this is actually Pershing Square. It's all hardscape. Most It's mostly hardscape. There's a little bit of grass on one side, but something the OpenStreetMap didn't actually get that correct because this is a, a plaza. So that should probably read as park. So I'm gonna create a new tag. I'm gonna call this P line or property line. And then I can assign this to a new tag and the reason why is because then from there I can use color override. I can use the um, color by tag override to play with to try out some different color styles. All right so we know where we are in the world now I want to spend I want to stop uh, I want to do two things I want to talk about where we can start storytelling about where you can get to within your traveling. So basically what we do is we do what's called like a walk shed analysis so in urban design or or even in architecture, we'll, we'll, when we step out and talk about context, we also talk about how, what you can get to, not just what's there, but how long does it take to get there. So I'm gonna start by drawing a circle here. And you've probably seen these, they're called walking circles. So if you've ever seen a map that has like a circle on it and it says one mile or it says half a mile, that's, um, that's what this is. So I need to do some math. What, a mile is 5,280 feet. So it would be, Yep. so my, so half of that would be divided by two is 2640 and the half of that is 1320. So what we can do is come over here and say, let's go 1320 feet. And then this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, I start to, I like to layer things above, like whenever I have information, like a, a polyline, I just layer all that stuff above. I stack it like this, because when you look at it in plan view, you you don't you don't ever know that it's a it sits above but because we're working with 3d buildings like if for some reason i wanted this there you know like because we have 3d buildings and 3d topography we're going to start losing some information because they're going to start blurring and blending so it all just depends on how you want to do it um, if you don't have topography and you want to show this underneath like that you can put it you can layer it underneath um, or what we could do is 
Again, I can show that in the working view so you can kind of see that. I'm going to change. Paul's from the chat says it's a vertical graveyard. It's a ver yeah, yeah. It's uh, Tyson's uh, boneyard, but it's uh, it's uh, it's vertical. And I do work. I do have a vertical boneyard, and that's because because I, information is always like going between 2D and 3D. So like if you have like a, a sketch plan or something that you imported and you're using that to place trees, and then when you're ready, you drop them onto the train service. So you guys have seen some of my other demos where I do that. So maybe I'll take that and make that a little bit bigger. Call that 25 feet. 25 feet, I'm working in feet. No, that's probably too big. What I'm doing is I'm doing the same thing that I did with the polyline, is I'm kind of offsetting um, a walking circle and I'm going to give that a color. So you can see in plan view, in plan view, we have our kind of site, which could be completely filled in if we want it, or it can be the perimeter. And then we have the walking circle, but the walking circle isn't an actual thing. You know, it's not like our site boundary where it's, it's that's our site boundary. A walking circle doesn't really exist. So one way to think about this too, is if I can find the center, Let's see here. Is that the center or is it trying? It's misleading me. Maybe if I have, if maybe if I had my fill on, that might be easier for me to find the center. There it is. So I might take a segment. I might come over here and just go from the middle and then just literally just grab a segment here, copy and paste that into place and make that a component. Oops, sorry, that's my camera angle. Didn't mean to do that. Um, make that a component. And then what I would do is copy this component, radial copy this line. This is how I'm making a 3D dashed line. So I would type in 360 for 360 degrees and divide it by 20. And that's a pretty wide dash. Divide it by 40. It's still too wide. Divide it by 50. divided by 55, being picky here. So I'll give you an example here. Now what I have, if I select all these components, select all instances, Randy from the comments says, there's nothing more annoying than orbiting around and then suddenly being blocked by a boneyard item you left up in the air. Uh, Yep, yep, yep. As you as you it gets more and more complicated, you're gonna start to see that there's gonna be um, it's gonna start to get a little messy. Um, and that's why I think just good organization, you know, having things on tags. Like if I just come over here and I would just call this, um, I already have the the polyline tag, so I might just take that because it's a boundary and not an actual geometry. I might just put that on P line or boundary BO, whichever you, you know I have, and then I can just go in really quickly and do. Um, in my plan view, I can have one that has it and one that doesn't. So this I want to bring on to, oh, I'm going to bring this on to base area. I'll tell you why, because I'm playing with the, I'm kind of messing with myself a little bit by creating this, by using the color by tag. Because then, if you do that, then you got it. You, now you're stuck with that system, right? So what, you're either coloring the raw geometry, or you can do it as an override. And I'm also going to try turning edges completely off for this, for this particular style. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to treat. The goal is that I'm creating a context map that I can begin talking about what's happening. So I can just layering this information where and i'm just trying to see what reads right you know do i want to do i want to focus the area inside of the circle do i want to focus the area outside of the circle um and i'm doing this all in sketchup for because because once i move to the next step where i do my shade analysis and my solar analysis and i do my section cuts you can see i'm doing it everything's on all the same piece of data 
So if for some reason somebody said, well, what would happen if you had a building that was even taller next door because there's actually a development proposal, building doesn't exist now, but it will be, you can just go in and sort of fake that building next door and then all of a sudden all your all your information, you know, your location map, your walk shed map, your site sections, everything updates because you just added that one piece of information. If you go to GIS and you go to Illustrator, you go to InDesign, you go to go to CAD, everything lives in different worlds. I'm taking all that information and bringing that into SketchUp. So SketchUp now is my home base. I want to show you a, a fun one more thing really quick. And then before we kind of move on to the next step, this is just frozen geometry. So I do like to have a frozen tag. And that's just stuff that like I don't need right this minute, but I might need later. So in this case, I might need that. So I'll just kind of freeze it. But one thing that's kind of cool is like creating a layer mask. So I'm only seeing what's happening inside of my little site bubble. So in order to do that, I would come in here and grab that and then paste that in place. And then delete that. And then probably don't want to hide those outer edges. Interesting. Do you see what we see where I'm going with this? Yeah. So now I have what's called, I have a layer mask. Essentially, I just put a layer mask in photo in um, in SketchUp. So when I go back to my plan view, I have only I have only what shows up in my um, my little walk shed analysis. So. If, if I do end up liking the color style that I did where I was playing with this color overlay stuff, I'm gonna delete that one. I don't like that one. I don't think that's helping me. Then, then the only thing is, is that I might wanna switch my untagged to something like white just to be safe because then that way I don't have to go in and create a new tag for that mask. So what's kind of cool is I can go back and forth between, yeah. So now I've got some different styles here. I've got my, um, I'm going to hide the edges, all of the edges on this. I don't think I need the edges. So I'm going to hide all the edges. Save. Randy says, what a great technique. So yeah, so, so in this case, um, I have I have one that I'm going to use to draw over. So I want it just black and white because we're going to, you'll see just in a, in, a, in a little bit, we're going to do some analysis, some sun studies and stuff. So I want that just to be like monochrome. But I also want one that's sort of more figure ground where I can kind of start pushing things a little bit more. So that's a really cool way to do that. And if I just kind of, let me just purge some stuff really quick because I want to send this to layout before I get too far. Time check, I'm doing good. So let me just um, purge any junk that came into this that I didn't end up using. Like I know I spent some time talking about the GIS stuff and then said, I don't think I need it because I'm, I'm zooming in. If I wanted to go bigger, if I wanted to go really big, I would do a GIS map. But in this case, I'm just diving right to sort of the district level diagramming because I think that's um, that'll work for our purposes. Um, so in this case, let's take a moment. I, let's save this and then let's send it to layout. Send to layout. So you can see I'm almost doing most of my diagramming. I'm almost doing everything in SketchUp. And then when I go to layout, there's a couple things I want to do in layout. You'll see here, and I'm not going to, um, we'll probably, depending on how much time we have, we can kind of push it a little bit and, and make something really beautiful, or we can just kind of touch on some topics. And then uh, you, you folks, you smart folks at home, um, you know, you kind of leave it to your imaginations as far as where you might want to take this technique. So. Um, the other thing too is we can, now that we have this in SketchUp and to layout, we can apply a scale to this, which I love. The current scale, I have no idea what scale. I mean, it's like a, it's, it's a half mile radius in downtown LA. So I might try something like one inch equals 500 feet. Hey, oh my gosh. Oh, that was almost exact. That was totally a random guess. And that was almost exactly right. So one inch equals 500 feet. We know this is to scale now. That, that's scale. Is that, was that crazy or what? <laughs> yeah. It's like I've done this before, folks. It's actually, I haven't. I haven't done this in a long time. Um, so a lot of this stuff is just, I'm just like, okay, come on. How much is still, how much is still down there? Um, Muscle memory. 
so what's cool about this is that I, uh, one thing about I love about layout too, I'm like a broken record. I'm like, what I love about layout? 10 things I love, 500, oh wait, that's a different movie. 10 things I hate about you. 10 things I love about um, layout. One of them is the style overrides. So I have two styles. Remember I set up two styles in my model, one of them being monochromatic that I can draw over and one of them being um, color override, color by tag override. So now I can have these two, if I wanted to set you know, a series of maps up, I could begin to, and then grab some text. And then this one might be um, landmarks. And let's give that some nice font. Where's my open sans? As much as I love veranda. Any font geeks out there? Anyone, any like topography people that like get really particular about which ones they're using? Do you have a favorite? Uh, I just set myself up for that, didn't I? No, I don't. I go through pure, <laughs> I go through phases. So there's like a time where I was working with a graphic designer and she introduced me to Proxima Nova. And I was, I'll show you that one. And I was like, here's Proxima Nova. And it's like super slick. I don't know what it is, so subtle, you know? It's like, does it look any different than any of the other ones? Maybe not, but it's something kind of nice about it. And then I would do some body text. Let me get some body text really quick, if you'll excuse me. We're gonna do a little tangent. Go for it. I just need, um, I just need, um, yeah. Oh, graphite font, Tahoma, public sands. Interesting responses in the comments. Oh, good. See, there you go. I love it yeah. when you when we mention something that gets people um, gets people talking. And what was the other one that I used to use with that worked really well? It wasn't Optima, but I keep wanting to say was it Noto Noteworthy? There's one that goes really well. Oh, I'm blanking right now. Leto? No, because I like to mix up the, my thick and my thin. I like fonts that have light where you can go from bold to light and not all of them have that. So that's kind of my short story. And I'm talking and I'm not actually, um, yeah. So Open Sans 13, yeah, let's just, let's just go with that. We're gonna go with Proxima Nova and Open Sans on these. So in this case here, I might just set this up, even though I don't know where I'm going with this yet, I might just set this up and then paste this one, and then this one is going to be something like walk shed. Right, so I'm starting kind of my diagramming process in plan view. The next step is going to be to diagram in 3D. So that's my first hour. I was kind of in, in my head. I was thinking maybe I just kind of walk through the process of setting up a simple um, urban design sort of context analysis plan. Map. Studio RT Cool says, just put a photo of Angel's flight on the form. Oh, he he must have just put an angel. Okay, I see. <laughs> I see what he's saying. Uh Cooper Copper Plate. Uh Lorem Lorem Ipsum. Isn't Lorem Ipsum the like the default text for most of the internet? I swear I see that all the time. Lorem Ipsum. It is. It is placeholder text. So like if you're working in InDesign or something like that, you could just say insert placeholder text and it, it, it inserts this exact block, which is for, there's a story behind it. I don't know it, but it's just Latin. It's just made up, just made up words that sort of looks like a block of text. Let's save that. I put a little bit of work into that. So let's go ahead and call this um, angels. Can I spell right? Null analysis. And now I have sort of the first page of my of my thing. Now, obviously, I, what I would want to do is I kind of stopped because it was sort of taking too long. But what I would like to do is, is actually have a page that comes before this and it locates our site. So um, in QGIS, for example, we know that we could we could go back and get that boundary. And um, you know, so I'm I'm not going to do this. I'm going to move on. But I would say that like normally I would use something like this. 
and I would bring this in and then I would color, you know, the city of Los Angeles to make sure that everyone knows like how bit where is LA in relationship to LA County. And then I would have like a dot or a big circle right on downtown LA, which is where of course Angels Knoll is. So we, we get that sort of scale. We're starting at the broadest scale and then we're gonna get all the way down to the site specific scale, like literally the contour lines on the existing slope. Yeah, we're an hour in. So let's pause, so, let's pause for a second and think about what we want to do yeah. next. Rykos from the chat said, I presume that this is a city layout. Yes. Um, I've always wanted to do a print on my 3D printer. Is this SketchUp guy making a, making a CD, uh, making a diorama in 3D? Yes, he is. Yes, but we're not 3D printing. So nope. you got to read the title in the live stream because what it does is it gives you or go to the forum because it tells you what we're doing um and then you and then from there you yeah then you have a better idea what to expect um we could if we wanted to uh sketchup does that does have that capability but that's that's not what we're doing today yeah it's a different process because then you got to be thinking about which you know, level of detail, of course, we need to be thinking about whether your objects are solid, right? So that when you send it to 3D printer, it recognizes it, it's happy, it doesn't go back and tell you like, no, I'm not going to print this. Um, so it's a whole different system if we wanted to make a, an actual physical model of this. So we're going to stay in digital land for today, for the next, um, for our time together today. Digital land, that's a, sounds like a fun place. That's the metaverse, isn't it? Yep. It was my Disneyland reference. And so, okay, I don't know if that. So one thing to think about is um, the way that I've oriented this right now is because I don't have any text on it or text labels or anything. I don't have a North arrow. We know North arrow. We know North is up because when you import the information, North is up by default. But if I wanted to take a different approach, I could turn my axes on and I will come over here and say place. And I will find something that is along this edge, which is a little bit difficult because when you get building footprints that are coming in from GIS, the building footprints themselves may actually be wonky. So you kind of have to be careful what you're aligning to, but let's just pretend that this is good. So I'm gonna to align to that so that when I go north up, what I'm finding here, and let me turn these back on, all of my hidden stuff that I just hid. Excuse me, view axes. So what I did there was I I rotated the grid. Now there's a reason why we sometimes want to do that. When we put things like street labels, like if I wanted to put this as Olive Street or something like that, I'm gonna turn my topography, excuse me, topography off for this one. So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add one really quick and I'm gonna call this um, plan rotated. And then I also want to look at my scenes and make sure that my axonometric preserves my camera location and that my plan rotated preserves my camera location. Okay, so there's reasons to do that. Now, if you want to know where the orth arrow is, the north arrow, you just turn your axis back on and click and click reset. And then what you can see is that your north arrow, if I drew an arrow along my green axis here, um, sometimes it's nice to place for me to place that north arrow in um, my model, and because we're doing a vertical boneyard, I'm going to go ahead and bring that up high. And the reason why is that if I just go, um, yeah, there's my north arrow. There's a reason why I want to do that is because if you're anything other than north, you want to have that north arrow in there. Um, because if I want, if I sent this particular scene to layout, for example, like I'm going to pop back over here into layout. Let's pop back over here into. Oh, did I quit layout? I didn't mean to quit it. I thought I just saved it. Okay, let's try this again. Uh oh, that's no, all right. Uh, well, let me find it. Sorry, I thought I just I saved it and then I didn't mean to close it. Oh, I know what it is. It's my fault. I have, this is the problem when you get, when they give you like 13 versions of SketchUp, we have like all the way, I have like all the old versions and then we get the alphas and all the betas. And so sometimes, um, Sometimes I accidentally open a different version of SketchUp, so shh. Um, it's still there. That's all right. It's just there. I don't no, say anything. I, yeah, okay. 
So for example, if I go back and um, just really quick, just to finish that thought, come over here and paste that one. And then if I switch the scene to, I have to save my SketchUp first. So not that one, too many instances of SketchUp. Save that. And then in layout, we can then uh, update the model reference and then come over here and switch it to plan rotate it. And what's cool about that is that I can just, there's my north arrow. It's like my little hidden north arrow. It's kind of sneaking in there. And then I pop over to my scrapbook and I'm going to find site graphics. This is not really my favorite north arrow, but just let's just run with it for now. Right. Yeah. It does what it needs to do, it right? Does. It's, does. it's going to do the job. So what I'll do is I'll just rotate it so that I'm in line with, I'll just double check this and just see how close I can get. I'm eyeballing it because no one's going to actually like, no one's going to actually like measure it and say, nope, nope, Eric, that's not going to work. So that little sneak, that little sneaky north arrow that I put in there, that was hidden one, it was just so that when I get in, because that's not the site graphics I'm going to use when I get in here later, like when I put a scale bar and stuff like that. North's important, but scale at this at this scale, it's not really that important to actually have a scale bar. So let's move into some analysis in 3D. How does that sound? I'm waiting for like if I had the sound effects, it would be like a bunch of kids in a class going, yay, <laughs> yay, yay. That's what I'm hoping that my all you at home are saying when I say. Yeah. You ready? You ready? <laughs> That's what I say to my dog when I take her for a walk. I say, you ready? You ready? And I get her all excited and then she starts wagging her tail. I was like, you guys ready? We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're, We're ready. This. I'm okay. ready. You're ready. Yeah. You're like, stop talking. Just do it. Okay. <laughs> so and gonna... he says, that's what we're here for. So he's ready. All right. So I'm going to kind of just, uh, I need to think for a second. Um, I'm going to think out loud for a second. We need to ask ourselves. I don't just diagram to diagram. Um, a diagram is really, really thoughtful. It's like it's like if you're writing a, a book or something, you don't just throw out random words. You know, you're really thinking about like, well, what, who is this? What's the emotion of this character? What are they trying to accomplish? What do I want the reader? How much information do I want to give the reader? You know, do I want them to, to sort of, you know, uh, or what do I want them to feel? The diagram is kind of the same way. Because I have to ask myself, well, what's important about this? Um, we kind of already did sort of what's the grid like and what, how many buildings and what are the landmarks and things within sort of a typical walking circle, which is a, a five-minute walk, which is a half, sorry, a half mile is a 10-minute walk. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about really quick is sun and shade. So sun and shade is, if I just turn my shadows on quickly, and I turn my this for I'm gonna need my topography on for this one because I want to be able to cast I need to be able to cast the shadow onto the surface for this one. So I'm gonna open up my shadow settings and I for this I'm gonna say don't cast shadows on the ground. You can see how how um, they're casting on the ground and I don't really want that. So I'm gonna turn the ground off so that they're only casting onto my surface and I'm gonna kind of darken it to a point where I'm gonna kind of darken it so that maybe it reads a little bit better. So this is where we're going to get into a little sun and shade study briefly. For this one, I think I'm going to turn my highways off, my parks off. Nope, I need my parks. Turn my circulation off. Turn my railways off. What else do I want to turn off? Um, OK, I'll leave that. It's just that I'm getting some Z fighting here. So if that's the case, I might, if I'm getting some Z fighting, I might come in and take this topography layer and just bring that down, that not layer, but this um, geometry mesh and just bring that down by, you know, call it like one foot, you know, just, just literally slightly, not enough to affect the shadow study, but enough that I'm not gonna get that, those overlapping lines. And um, yeah, so it just depends on how, I, how everything was layered together. So let's add one here. I'm going to add a scene, and we're going to call this shadows, and then we're going to do an axonometric. So with shadow studies, typically what we'll want to do is we'll want to do, we want to look at three times a day, twice a year. So you want to know the morning, you want to know the afternoon, midday, and you want to know, uh, yeah, so midday would be noon, 
and then you want to know kind of the afternoon. You can do as many as you want, but I'm going to kind of start with those. And you want to do it on the solstice, and uh, you want to do it on both solstices. So we would do it in the summer, and we'd do it in the winter, because those are the extremes. It tells you what the extreme sun is going to be in the summer, and it tells you what the extreme winter, when the sun is really low and it sets, um, and it doesn't go that high, meaning both high in the sky, but at also high latitude and longitude. Um, lat, I mean, okay. All right, let's just do it. Show, don't tell. That's what I said I was going to do this when I started. Yeah, Randy said, I just learned something new about shadows. And I did, even myself, I didn't realize like how much shadows played into, you know, planning aspect of, of everything that, you know, goes into spaces like this. So I'm going to write nine, I'm going to write um, 621. It's really important. Okay, so sorry I didn't answer your question because I'm thinking uh, or what you're, I didn't respond, Donovan, because shadows are really, really important, especially in this case, it's in an urban context. So if you're, let's say, putting a roof deck with a pool, you might put it on one side of the building or the other side. Now, a lot of us designers can just look at it and say, I know where it, I know where the sun goes. I know where it needs to be. But we do these drawings not for us. We do them for non-designers. So it's important that not just that we understand how to do it, but it's important that we're able to communicate that to those that don't understand it. That's a big part of what we do. It's why we draw so much. It's like, I know what it looks like. I'm the designer. It's in my head. But this isn't for me. This is for you. So in this case, I'm going to go to 12 p.m. And then I'm going to save, I'm going to add a new scene. And I'm going to rename this to 621. And that's going to be noon, because there's actually no such thing as 12 p.m. It's just noon. And I might do 3 p.m. That's my 621 rename. So that would be um, 621, and that would be 3 p.m. So let's toggle through those briefly. I've got this one, this one, and this one. Now, if I wanted to have some fun with this, if I didn't know how I wanted to share this information yet, I've been showing it in plan view and I told you I was gonna try to move out of plan view in this step. So what would happen if we turned camera location off for each of these? So it means that I could come around and I could study what this angle looks like and I could look at it at 9 a.m., noon, and at 3 p.m., which is pretty sweet. Um, and I can see that in the summer, in 3 p.m., I get the corner of my site is going to be completely in shade. That could be a good thing because that's a hot time of day. So that might be a place where people can hang out because in L.A. it's hot. Um, and then in the morning, it's pretty much blasted. The sun's going to be up by then because you can see that most of the higher buildings are to the northwest. So in this case, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep going. You guys get it. You get it. You're with me. So what we yeah, Randy says I do the exact same thing for our house placement to maximize solar panel efficiency, which I guess would be a really good application for that. Yep, that's a good point because we're doing different. I mean, when we talk about sun analysis, we're talking about both sun, which is where you might want to capture it in a good way, like especially if you're in Vancouver. They in Vancouver, BC, they actually are the opposite of LA. They place plazas where you're going to get sunlight. They say buildings can't block another person's open space. So they're really particular about where they put towers so that they don't block the sun. And here in LA, we're the opposite. I'm not in LA, I'm in California, but uh, we need to know where um, where we want shade. So we're looking for those kinds of things, unless you're looking for solar, solar efficiency, in which case you, you want the sun. So I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna add another one, and I'm just going to do this very quickly. I'm gonna stop talking and just do this kind of quick. 12, 21, 9 a.m., and then click over here and then go switch from 621 to 12. I'm gonna add that. There are extensions that automate this process, but I'm kind of talking through it manually because it's just, it tells a little bit more about why we do this. And that's noon. And then I'll move on here in just a second. Last one, 3 p.m. I'm gonna switch that from six to 12, which is December. And that's gonna be where we get lots of shade because that's December after, in the afternoon. And I'm going to add another one, and I'm going to say um, that's 12 21, and that's going to be 3 p.m. So, those, those, the, you could do a lot more times a day, but those at a minimum would kind of get you where you need to be. Um, move, move left, move left, move left. I'm going to move all my 12, all of my 
sixes together in all of mine. If you wanted to animate the shadows too, you could come over here. If you wanted to export a GIF or if you wanted to open up a movie like a J, uh, and do that as part of your presentation, it could be a good idea because we're, we're only showing these stages. But what you could do is come over here to animation and just say that we want to have maybe four seconds between those. I want to see what the sun path looks like. So when I switch to from, um, all right. So I can watch the sun rise. I can start at 9 a.m. in the morning in December and I can click noon. And you can see because I don't have a camera location, I can kind of move around and then I want to go to 3 p.m. And I can do that shadow study. So that's, you can see in, the, in, in December at 3 p.m., even with low rise buildings, the site's going to be completely in the shade, unless you're on a podium, in which case you're going to be up high. So yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Randy commented about uh, the view corridors in Vancouver being a big thing. And I remember when we were up there for 3D Base Camp, of that being part of the city layout is the view corridors. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of similar process that we're using here. Um, only instead of analyzing where shade is, you would analyze, you would have your view cone. You'd lay your view cone in over the analysis map and then you would look to see where you are within that view cone you want to stay out of it um obviously you would want so that that's another layer of information that would come in to, at this stage uh, this would be that would, is exactly what you need is like okay where are my where's my urban growth boundary where's it bring all this information in so it's in my model um so yeah so let's look at really quickly um we have to think about how we want to present this information. So one thing we could do is, I'm going to look at my shadow settings. Okay, nope, those are probably already fixed. I could come over here and turn my edges and my profiles off. And then what I would want to do is turn my Where's my walking circle though? Maybe I need my edges on just for a second because I can see where was my, I didn't delete that, did I? Nope, there it is, okay, unhide, okay. I need all my site boundary, I want my clipping mask, I want my walking circle. So, oh man, I kind of made the mistake because what I have to do is I have to unhide all this information. Maybe what I do is just just delete, delete, copy it, delete it, and then paste it back in place. And then that way it's, it's gonna be there. Okay. For this, this is gonna be annoying because I don't wanna see the, the I don't want to see that, um, transition anymore and I also don't want my my layer mask I don't want any of this information to cast a shadow so under entity info there's this tiny little if you look at this right above my head here you, there's that little thing that says don't cast shadows so I don't want them I don't want this box like my little boneyard stuff I don't want that to cast or receive shadows so I'm going to go to my shadows um, I'm going to go to my shadows scene and then I'm going to click 9 a.m noon 3 p.m., 9 a.m. again, noon, 3 p.m. Okay, so that looks pretty good. So now let's save those, and then let's pop over into layout really quick. And then I want to do, I think I'm going to have time for one more diagram. I'm going to take this sun analysis to the next level. We're going to level up here. I don't think we need this one. I was just showing you what rotated north looks like. I don't think... Um, don't think we need that but what we do need is if we go to pages and i just call of this i'm just going to call this one you know context map uh, it's called location context this would be a good point to use auto text because then i could just come over here and say page name and see it picks up the page name so that's kind of cool it's pretty sweet and this is going to be shadow study 
So I will copy this text from here to here and shadow study. Didn't even need to type that in. So let's grab nice. this. Yeah, nice. Let's grab this one here. We're gonna need to change the scale, but I'm not gonna do that yet. We're gonna need to update the model reference to make sure that it picks up those changes that we made. And then I'm gonna find under my scenes, I'm gonna find 9 a.m. So there's 9 a.m. And I'm gonna copy and paste this and slide this over because I wanna see, I want six on a page. So I might actually need to shrink the scale. If I'm gonna do it to scale, I probably wanna change the scale. And if I'm not gonna do it to scale, um, Let's see, I could just kind of fake it, but let's change the scale to, that was one to 500. How about one to 750? Yeah, all right, fine, one to 750. And this one is going to be the first one. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put a placeholder here. Um, this is gonna be date and slash time. And I'm going to center that one, this call out, because that's all I wanted for this one. And the reason why I'm doing this is, excuse my zooms. What I'm doing is I'm just going to do this once. And then I'm going to copy and paste this over a bunch of times. So I'm going to group this. And then I'm going to copy and paste it in place. Or there's a little trick. You can use the modifier. You hold Option or Control. And then what it does, it's, it's a move copy. So the move copy is kind of a cool um, thing that you can do in layout. And I'm going to get those looking good. Copy, or I'm gonna use the move modifier again because I like that method. And I'm gonna just drag those straight down. And then from here, I'm just trying to get this somewhat centered. All right, so from here, once I've got all those in place, all I have to do is just come over here. That's 12.31 at 9 a.m. That's 12.30 um, at noon. And this last one is, excuse me, 3 p.m. And then I could come over here and grab this one. This one should be 6.21 at 9 a.m. This one is 6.21 at noon. I'm totally just making all this stuff as, up as I go. So if it works out at all, like if this works, if this looks halfway decent, I'm 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 happy. Uh, 12 21 3 p.m. That's 6 21 3 p.m. Okay. Um, what do you think? It's looking good. Looks very professional, very efficient. Yeah, because uh, it's right now it's as much about the, f the final product, of course, is something that we could spend a bunch of time on. We could spend our whole two hours just making this, getting the graphics dialed in and making that look good and layering information. But I really want to kind of go back and forth between um, the process and then the end product because because we don't we won't have time to really do the product justice. So in this case, I want to do 6-21 and that would be... Um, 9 a.m. So let's head out of here. I'm going to finish these labels because I feel like um, my OCD if I don't. So thanks everyone for just letting me do this. Yeah, people are chiming in the comments saying that it looks good, good result, looks very complete. Okay. Now, um, yes, of course, we could go a step further and we could layer the shadows so you can take these exports and you can layer them. And the reason why a layered export might, um, I think I have an example um, because I don't want to do it, but I wanted to kind of say that this is just a starting point and we can obviously go much further. I did one a long time ago for a class, pro uh, teaching a class where you can see where I did three shadow exports and layered them on top of each other. And you can see that these are the three winter shadows. So 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. layered on top. And what's what's really cool about when doing this, and I'm not gonna do it right now because it'll take too long, is that you can see in the spot, like this dark blue right here, that means no sun gets there at all, ever, during the winter, at all, during the, at, during the winter solstice, um, during that time of year. So when you really think about putting like an outdoor patio or something like that. It's like, well, are we doing fire pits? Is it covered? Is it heated? 
um, you really kind of consider what you do outside there. And then this is the opposite. So this is the summer. So if you look at like this courtyard here in between this group of four buildings, this courtyard, there's a little space in the middle that doesn't get any shade at all during when this at the peak of the summer, like not even so. So uh, and then that's also another reminder that even in the winter, that little courtyard, that middle of that courtyard doesn't get any sun. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, okay, we're gonna wrap up um, with a little 3D. We're gonna do a little fun in 3D because I kind of teased you with like a 3D graphic and that's why we kind of want to play in 3D for a little bit. And then we're gonna see, we're gonna say that we're gonna call it. We've got time. 12, 21, and that is 9 a.m. Did it. Shadow study. A lot of these things are just checklist items too. It's like, you know, you know did, what did we learn from it? Eh, we learned a little bit. Yeah, there's shade there in the afternoon during the summer. That's important, but a lot of this is just, again, showing the client. Like, we studied the sun. We're aware of the patterns. We know what we kind of were. So a lot of this is just um, also sometimes just showing them that we did our due diligence. So, um, cool. Mapping, mapping, mapping. Let's see here. Not that one. I want to go to this one. Okay. Um, and again, you know, I kind of did that at different angles. So if you wanted to do those, if you wanted to do the sun and shade study, um, if you wanted to do that same one, you could do that same analysis in um, in perspective mode, which I don't know. Maybe that's kind of cool. That's maybe even cooler than doing it in plan view. But so there's a question saying, is there a way to use auto text to use the scene name to label the different images on the page? Yes, and I should have done that. And I was like, in my head, I was thinking, oh, it's not that many labels. Like, do I really need to use auto text for this? And um, I should have. So I, if you're not sure what auto text there are you can go over into your document setup because they're specific to your document. So back in layout, you come into auto text and there should be at least, let me see if I can add one. Scene name. Hmm. I thought there was one for scene name. Maybe somebody knows better than I do. I could be wrong. I could be imagining it. Or it could be something is on our roadmap, and I can't promise if it is, but it could have been something I saw somewhere. Custom text date created. I thought you could tap it to the scene. Huh. Okay. Sorry, but that answers the question. No, I I thought um, I that would be cool, wouldn't it? I want to show you an extension. Uh, one way to do, I want to wrap up sun and shade really quick, but I want to do it with an extension. Um, it's called Curic Sun. So for those that have seen, have heard of this one, I'm going to go view tool palettes and find Curic Sun. If it's not loaded, I'm going to see if it needs to be loaded. Sometimes when you have too many extensions, you it's nice I unload the ones you don't use very often, like this one I don't use very often. This is a free extension. So thank you, Mr. Curic, or Ms. I think it's Mr., but... Curic and two palettes, Curic Sun. So in this case, I'm going to turn off, for right now, I'm gonna turn off my little hidden mask boundary, which I think if I go to my AXO, if I go to my axonometric, there. Um, and then there's one that's called Show and Hide Shadows. So if I click on that, it's just gonna show the shadow. That's fine, we've already done that. But there's more to it than that. We can actually show the sun's path, which I think is kind of cool. So it's a little bit like a sky dome. So if you think about it, it's this invisible information. It's a bit like how SketchUp uses overlays. And it's showing you the sun's path. And I'm going to make this a little bit more apparent just by darkening my shadows a bit so we can see. Uh, how do I want to do this? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, and so you can actually move the sun. You can literally just click on a spot and it'll tell you, instead of going in and using SketchUp's date and time, you can physically grab the sun and pick the path. So like if I wanted to see what the, if I hover over this, it'll tell me 622 
at uh, 7 hours, which is, I don't know if that means 7 a.m. I think that might be 7 a.m. because it's, the sun's rising in the east in the summertime. So there's something that's kind of nice because what it's doing, it's actually visualizing that sun path. That sun is here. My site is here at this corner, and it's showing me. And if I go into plan view for a second, and if I click on show sun, then... Okay, so now the only challenge with this one is that the only thing I don't like about it, and maybe it's just because it has to be like this, is that the sun's path is not geometry. So if I say show, show sun, you'll notice that it shows up, but only, um, it's, it's so temporarily. I can't say turn this into geometry. So if I wanted to, to do this as an overlay, I might come in here and say, I might actually turn everything off and I'll show you why I'm going to do this in a second. And then um, and hide that and show sun. I might do something like this and then just grab a screenshot. I know this is cheating. Again, this is why I say that I don't like that it's not geometry because it's not actually in the model. And then what I could do is come back over here into, let's see here. If I grab a screenshot, then that means it's going to be, it's going to be not transparent. Oh, that's okay. Hmm, is that okay? Uh, let's try it. Let's try it. Let's not go to Photoshop. So back in layout, if I wanted to, I can pull this image in here and I could sort of shrink that down and I actually have something that shows me the sun's path. Now I might not, I might not want to actually see this whole thing. I might just want to reference it. And I'll give you an example of what I mean is that if I draw a circle here, and I'm going to style this circle to look more like a sun. I don't really like that color. It's too yellowy for me. Okay, so that's my summer sun. That's sunrise and that's sunset. And then I'm going to come over here and one more time, and I know that my winter sun sets here, and it sets here. And then I could come in here and use something like the arc tool. Now, I have to be careful. This is not, you'll notice that this is not a um, single, this is, the sun's path is not a uniform arc. It's actually a compound arc. So what I might want to do is, you know, I might have to do some editing here a little bit, but we got, you get Transom it. is asking if there's, uh, if there's one for the moon or if it's just the sun. Um, Transom, we're not talking about the moon right now, man. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the moon's bad. That's a good question. I probably not because I don't think the moon's effect on site analysis is as important unless you're like, your project is really, um, like working with the tides, like in which case I think it may be, um, kind of important. So I'm going to just kind of, I'm just going to move this off to the side because I might still need it. Um, and then I'm going to select, I drew this, I'm going to select all of these things here. And this is messy. Like I'm just, I'm just goofing, right? So obviously if I was doing this proper, I always say this over and over again. If I'm going to do this proper, spend a little bit more time, sort of style this up, arrange this to the front, bring this to the front, and then maybe even take this line and give that a dashed line weight just to kind of indicate that this isn't real geometry. So from there, I have this, this thing that represents the sun's, the, the sun's path. And this is kind of important because this is unique to Los Angeles because it's latitude long, longitude dependent. So if you're further north, the sun's gonna set further to the north. And if you're closer to the equator, the set the sun both in the extremes are gonna be closer together, which means you're not gonna have such extreme highs, you're not gonna have such extreme lows in the winter. So this path is specific to Los Angeles. Actually, it's not just specific to Los Angeles, but Los Ange downtown Los Angeles. So that's kind of cool. If you wanted to kind of add another layer of analysis or, if, you, if that was too much work to go in and spend that time tracing it, you could always just come over here and do something like this and then just um, get, your, get it looking the way that you want it to, get it looking good, and then maybe even just grabbing, I don't know, grabbing a screenshot or something like that. Just grabbing a screenshot. 
Um, shadows, I said, don't have them on the ground. Maybe even just grab a screenshot like this. Or, uh, and then from there, when you go back into, when you go back into your layout file, you know, you're not doing all this work to redraw the map. You could just go over here and um, just grab that screenshot in. And Studio RT Cool says, I used an extension from TIG once that turned shadows into actual geometry. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. TIG Shadow Projector. That one is cool. I have a video, I have a little video on that one because what that does is that preserves the the shadows as geometry. So if you wanted to layer, if you wanted to stack shadows, like if instead of showing them as scenes, 9 a.m., noon, 3, I could actually do it as um, as geometry. And then that way they stay in the model, which is pretty cool. So that you don't have to worry about, you can turn the shadows off and those would still be there. So, so I'm gonna pause there for a minute because we have a little bit of time left and I've got a bunch of different things we can do, whether we annotate a little bit more in layout, we look at a couple, um, we cut some sections and we, and we you know, sort of take a different, we do kind of a different version of our site analysis. We start looking at topographic analysis, which is where we're gonna cut contours and we'll cut some sections so we can have a page dedicated to where our site sits in relationship to the slope in downtown LA. Um, or we can kind of just, you know, keep it loose and just spend, you know, 15, 10, 15 minutes answering questions and just playing around. What do we think? How's everyone feeling? Brandy um, says, does anyone notice the, I don't even know if I'm saying this right, analamus in the sum model? Mm, what was that? Analamus? Analamus? That's a word I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. Love it when we learn. We always learn stuff in these in these threads. Um, oh, I wanted to show you something while I'm thinking about while you're thinking about whether we want to kind of spend a little bit more time in SketchUp and do another version, do some slope analysis, or whether we want to sort of stay in layout and just kind of gussy up a drawing and make it look pretty. Um, that was kind of the teaser image that I showed. I showed some mapping, and then I also showed some stuff in 3D. So we can have sort of two directions on where we want to wrap up. But I do, while we're doing that, I did come across this website that I kind of wanted to point out. It's called Travel Time. And if I type in, um, let's see here, let's go back. Let's see if it'll let me do it. Okay. I want to choose a place. Okay. Um, I want to type in Los Angeles. Let's see what happens. Yes. Okay. So what this is, it's a walk shed analysis. So when I did my little walking circle, that's actually wasn't a walking circle so much. That's just a distance circle that just kind of gives you a sense of scale of where we are and especially in relationship to the street grid. But in this case, um, I want to see how, literally how far I can walk in 10 minutes, which is, um, let's see, I'm gonna go five, let's go 10 minutes and I wanna change from cycling to walking. And then I'm gonna find our site, which is right here it's on, it's on um, West 4th and all, between Olive and um, South Street next to Pershing Square. So if I drag my little person over to our metro station, you get out of the metro station and you say, how far can I walk? You'll notice that it's not a perfect diamond because we're on a street grid. We're on a fairly well-connected street grid, but you'll notice that when you get places like a street that's not pedestrianized or if you get to something like a highway overpass and you have to go around or even like something, a natural feature like rivers, um, we're not going to get as good of a walk shed. So in this case, that's great. So um, now this is another problem with the data is that we can't get this. I have to come over here and if you are like me in SketchUp and you love the freehand tool, let's see here. One thing I need to do is figure out how big this needs to be. So we're going, there's no scale on this. So I'm just gonna have to grab a building reference or something. Let's try this one. This one looks fairly, let's see if we can get that scale to work. 267 feet. And that was that building. Whoops, 267 feet. Do I want to resize it? Yes, it looks like it did at that time, thanks. 
So this would be like my walk shed. How far can I walk in 10 minutes from my site? Probably should have done five minutes because it's going to take me outside of the boundary of our site, but that's okay. And then I've got this funny, I've got this cool little thing. It's a Cintiq where you can, it's a tablet pen. I don't know if you've seen Tyson. Anyone seen Tyson model with one of these? So this is my best friend when yep. you combine the Cintiq with um, the freehand tool. I'm going to move my mic for a second because I'm going to lean into this. And I'm just going to trace this. You can see how fast I am with the freehand and the pen. And I'm not looking for perfection here. I'm looking for close enough. I would love if I could have imported this as raw data, but I can't. So I brought it in as an image. And I'm tracing it using the freehand tool. They sell these really cheap. Do you know what they're called, Donovan? They're Wacom. They're not the bamboos, but they have like these little mini ones. Yeah, the little mini ones. What are those called? I remember that they were demoing them. At, we were at Adobe Max, yeah. I think, and, Wa and Wacom was there, and they had a bunch of them. Or no, or was it ISTE? I think I was at ISTE conference. Yeah, that was at ISTE was when at we ISTE? were across from the, uh, the Wacom people. Because that's where I first learned how to say it properly. Because for the longest time, I was always saying Wacom. And the rep was like, nope, what do you do with a mole? You whack them. Or whack them. So now I'm going to move my mic back so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that you can see how fast I was able to do this analysis here. So this is actually, um, I do like it. Actually, I do like it below. I would have to turn my you were asking about the little Wacom tablet is the Intuos. Is it the Intuos? Yep. Is that the? Yep. yep, that's the little ones that they had at the, the ISTE. Yeah, so this is, um, that was a little segue because I, I said I, I was, I, I posed the question to the group and then I, and then I um, sort of segued really quick because what I did want to do was say, well, that little walking circle that I drew originally, um, this one, you can see that that's just literally physically distance, but that's that's 10 minutes. So this is says this is a half mile, right? So a half mile. No, it's not a half mile. This is a quarter mile. So this is actually this shape here is kind of abstractly how far you can walk in five minutes. So I should have done that as five minutes and not 10 minutes. So whatever. Um, but then but then you can see that this blobby shape is actually how far you can walk in 10 minutes. So you can cover pretty good portion of downtown, pretty good connectivity here in downtown LA. For those that didn't know it, LA is walkable. Downtown is anyway. Um, I'm going to, I'm thinking I'm just going to move that up into my, into my, my boneyard and then we'll decide whether I want to um, decide whether I want to bring that into layout later or not. And that's kind of cool. So if you wanted to do that, I'll wrap up that little tip here by just saying that if you wanted to change Oops, not that one. If you wanted to change the the walking distance from 10, you could go down to something like five minutes. Um, you can also go further out. If you go bicycling, of course, um, if we go cycling, we could say that you could get cover a much bigger area within downtown LA. Be a little scary, to be honest with you. I've ridden that, those streets, a little scary. Um, but that's actually the five minute one. So that's the one that I should have, um, that's the one that I should have, I should have drawn because it's, all right, so there we go. I'm gonna look at my bag of tricks really quick. Peter says I have a Wacom, Wacom bamboo and I find it very useful. Um, oh good, yeah, so I've got a Cintiq which is a little bit different. All right, we're going to wrap up here. I'm going to um, I'm going to think about what other information that we want to show, and we could show wind. But again, the same thing is that that's not something that SketchUp doesn't have wind capabilities natively. So there's this called a wind rose, which is this one in the bottom corner. Um, that information is available. There's no real advantage to doing this in SketchUp though, because it's really out of the context. It's not drawing on our street grid it's not drawing on building heights or shadows the wind i think is independent it's climate it's climatic so i'm not going to do that but i will point out that to sort of round out our analysis we would maybe maybe get some wind information and include that um 
we could look at the topography. The physical setting obviously is really important. And I'll probably just do two things and then we'll just take, we'll end it a little bit early. But one thing that's gonna be kind of interesting is if I turn off my buildings and I make sure my topography is turned on, you can see, um, even if I, yeah, there we go. You can see the, the streets and things like that. It's probably, this is coming in from OpenStreetMap data. So this is probably similar to the level of detail you get. If I turn my hidden geometry on, you can see that's pretty um, high level. When I say not high detail, I mean like high level. Um, so I guess I should say low poly. So if it was really, really important to get a good accurate site analysis from a graphic standpoint, you'd probably of course get a site survey and if you can't get a site survey, there's my method that I've used where we can bring heat maps in and we can import information using height maps or heat maps and then turning that into raw geometry. But this is what we've got. So let's use it. It's, 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 it'll help, it's better than nothing. So let's go ahead and look at, the first thing is contours. So if I go into the topography group on the mesh group, I don't know why this park, I don't know why this park is 3D. I'm gonna I'm gonna just get rid of it because the parks aren't 3D. So, um, so I go into my mesh group here, and there's a great extension. Speaking of TIG, TIG has a great extension that's called Contours. So you can run a contour, and depending on the size of your site, if you're doing a really big area like this, you may want to be careful and start with a larger number and don't do one foot contours because you might find that it's gonna sit and just turn and turn and turn and turn. So I'm gonna sort of maybe play it safe and say, well, what is a 10 foot? What do 10 foot contours look like? spread across this whole you know part of downtown which is um as we know this is about a half mile across and there it is the nice thing about contours is that if we literally just let me see if this helps to look at it in x-ray is that we can kind of get a sense just by looking at the contours if we know what the high point is like if we say high point right here I believe the high point is here. But in relationship to our site, let's go look at plan. Nope, not that one. That's color by tag. Um, shadows. There we go. Let's go to shadows. And we'll turn those off. I'm going to rename this one topography. So the cool thing about it's um, the cool thing about TIG Contour Maker is that it automatically puts the contours on their own tag. So in this case, what I could do is just I could actually call this Contour Ten because I know that those are like my major contours. And if I wanted to, I could change that to a dashed line just to indicate that it's not geometry. And then the second thing I could do is go ahead and if I think that those ten foot contours are kind of um, if I think we can get a little tighter than that, just to see what the kind of nuances there are, we could come over here and let's see here. We could come back into the topography group and we could run it again and go extensions, contours. And we're gonna call this, let's do those as five foot. So let's do half of what we just did. It's gonna take a little bit longer now because it's a lot more um, geometry. It's a lot more line work that it's creating. So there they are, there's my fives. And those put, come automatically to a new tag. So I'm going to rename those contours. I'm kind of flying fast and loose with my tag names. Normally I'm a little bit more organized. It's Friday after all. Um, oh, I know what I want to do. Oh, I'm going to do some styling. Ooh, that would be good. Yeah, we're going to do some, we're going to change the style up. So style. And what we're going to do is go, I'm going to call this one contours or oh, by material. And then we're going to come over here to topography and change the style to that one by material. See what I did there? Did you catch that? Did you catch it? Um, by switching the edge style, by editing the edge style from going all the same to by material, what it's doing is it's, it's going to, anything that we color, we can actually color edges now. 
So in this case, if I wanted to show the relationship between, if I wanted the edges of the buildings to be a different color, um, you can just color the buildings a different color and then switch to hidden line style. There it is. So, so if I wanted to do the, I wanted to undo that because maybe I didn't actually want to do that. So um, I actually liked my buildings faded out, but maybe I want my contours. I can come in here to my contour group. Yeah, let's go to, let's hide this. I come into my contour group and I can actually paint those different colors. So if I want my little contours to be something like pink, it's probably easier to paint them in here, pink. And then I want my big contours to be something like blue. Then when I come over here to my topography plan, it just helps my it helps them read a little bit more. Do you know what I mean? Like, are you see, uh, Donovan? Like, is it feel like they yeah. pop? Like, it's just all about yeah, the contours. The contours. Yeah. Yeah. So Studio RT Cool, you may have already answered this. Says, is the group original the starting contour level? The starting contour level is the lowest point of the group. So it will start if you're let's say let's say literally in in real space, it starts at you know, your model is clipped to start at 200 feet above sea level. It'll start that, it'll start it not at what is 200 feet necessarily. It'll start it at whatever that zero, whatever the bottom point of your mesh is. So as it relates to real contours, it may actually, you may have to think about that. You may have to position your mesh or you may have to clip it so that when you, whatever your starting point of what you run the contour is, you know what that is. Because otherwise what I'm doing is I'm looking at these contours and I might put a high point in there and then I might put the contours, but I have to be careful to, I can't say that this contour is 201 and this contour is two, um, a, 210 or whatever. Does that, does that answer the question? Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to add this now. I'm gonna go back over here to here and I don't know, I could do two things. I could, I'm going to leave my, I'm gonna leave these the scale that they are, but I'm gonna make my page size a little bit bigger. So sh I'm gonna cheat, document setup, paper. And I'm just gonna make my paper a little bit better, 18 by 13, 12. Actually, 11 by 17. That's right. I was using A3, so this will actually work. Switch to 11 by 17. And the reason why is that I want to um, I want to see if I can squeeze one more in, in here. I may not be able to. We're gonna wrap up with something cool. I want to have I want to get that topography one that we just did. Whoa! What did I just do? What did I just do? I don't know what happened. Oh, I know what I just did. It's that walk shed analysis. It's showing up. So, um, yeah, I should probably delete that. Do you remember in SketchUp when I did that little trace of that walk shed thing? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I thought there it is. It's frozen. So what I need to do then is because it's on a frozen tag, this is where it gets a little bit tricky when we get all this data now piling up into SketchUp is that we've got to be really clear about how we've organized our layout file. Because what I want to do is make sure that I go into each of those, go into my tag overrides, and then make sure that that frozen tag is turned off. And so that's why I was caught off guard because I was like, whoa, what did I just do? That is my topography. Oh, that's really hard to see. Oh, I know why. It's because by default the contours turn are turned off. Yeah, what do you? Th what I, I'm I'm pretty stoked here. File document setup. Let's get this last page size looking pretty good. Let's go to twenty inches wide. Let's give ourselves a little bit of breathing room. And Mod then, says this view would be a good design for a DVD cover, which they kind of look like it once you have them selected and they're outlined. A little DVD. Oh yeah, it's kind of yeah. cool, huh? Um, I don't know why these. It was my scrapbooks that threw this whole thing off. These are bigger than they're supposed to be. I'm just gonna. Let's wrap up. Just want to find my page. All right, let's collapse those. 
Um, we did it. Didn't know where we were going. It's like when you guys come with me on these journeys, you know, we don't, we have kind of a vague destination in mind. I kind of know where we're going, but I really don't know. And I'll tell you why is because what I know is the process, not the end product. I believe in the process and the product just comes out of it. Like we, like here, I had no idea what we were going to do today, how far we were going to get. But we actually have, you know, in less than two hours, we have not, we have a viable site analysis. We have the start of a viable um, urban analysis. And that's, again, can be used in a lot of different contexts. And so again, for, from here, the next step that I would go in is to annotate. So I would put, I would put some color fills, and I'd put some dots and some stars and some arrows, and I would use layout then to add that next level of information. Because we don't do text in SketchUp, we do text in layout. Um, so that's the one part that I'm missing. But I think hopefully you all can use your imaginations. You can think about where I put my spot elevations and where I put my street labels, and I would do that here. But um, but even still, to get this far, I think that's pretty cool. And to know that we did it in 3D, to know that we have all this information here um, at our fingertips, whether we're doing the walk sheds, the walk circles, the north arrows, the contours, all this information here is sort of for us, um, is for us to play with, to toggle it on and off, you know, to move it up and down, uh, to style it, you know, and get it just the way we want to do, just the way we want. So it depends on your story. Depends on what you're trying to say. So I'm going to say, here's what I'm going to say, is thank you uh, all for watching. Couldn't do this without you. Um, it would just be me talking to myself. And that's, I do that um, Monday through Thursday and then Saturday and Sunday. So Friday morning, I get to do my time. I get to do this with you. So Donovan, thanks as always for co-hosting and for of course. Um, yeah, helping me out here. Anything? Uh, any last uh, comments before that we want to relay before we just, or any announcements we want to make? We will be here next week, but I know the holidays are coming up, so we'll start to taper off um, towards uh, towards uh, Christmas in the new year. Yeah, Brandy chimed in and said, another great stream where I learned new techniques throughout, which honestly with Eric and his live streams is always the case. I totally agree. Uh, and just by way of announcement, um, if you haven't heard already, 3D Basecamp tickets are up for sale for 3D Basecamp 2024. So if uh, if all things SketchUp is is your jam, uh, come hang out with us because that's our jam. We're going to be in Las Vegas in November, and you can come uh, you can come be part of 3D Basecamp. Yes, I will say I will be heavily involved in the planning of it. So I will be personally sad if everyone here doesn't come hang out and come say hi and introduce themselves and, hey, I'm yeah, from the forum and oh, I've watched the live streams because then I can start putting a face to the avatar. So I know not everyone has the ability to get to Las Vegas, but for those that can make it, it will make it worth your time. I promise I'm going to be I have to own that statement because I'm going to be on the planning committee. So um, that just keeps that's just the reason why we, we keep we keep our game high because um because we don't, we want to, we want you all to come and not just hang out with us, but also learn, uh, learn so much. It's so, it's such a great experience. So yeah, thanks, Don, man. Um, do we know what yeah, anyone's thanks, doing next Eric. week? We don't know yet, do we? Uh, we don't know yet, but I'm sure it will be. Uh, I'm sure it'll be great. I think. Is it Aaron's? No, Tyson. Tyson's turn. Tyson's. I think Tyson's up on the. Yeah, I think Tyson's up on up. the block. All right. Yep. I'm gonna let you go. It's time. So thanks it's again, time. everyone. Don't forget SketchUp Campus. That's where you're gonna learn the, you get the full coursework. Don't forget if you haven't already, like to subscribe, get the notifications from us. Um, it helps with our numbers. It helps with our analytics. We appreciate you. Um, and then lastly, um, every Friday, we will see you next time. All right, thanks Donovan. Let's do it. Let's head out. Let's do it.